everybody's attention, please. Uh, we're going to uh, call this work session to order. This is Monday, February 27th, uh, 2017. It is 4.30 p.m. Uh, before we get started with the meeting tonight, um, one of our heroes have fallen. Um, one of our protectors <coughs> has walked into eternity uh, over the weekend, and uh, I'd like to take a few minutes, if we could, just to to stand, have a moment of silence before we go into this meeting. If you guys would please join me. Thank you all very much. I'd just like to also let Cindy uh, Franciscovich know that uh, she's on our thoughts and also in our prayers. <clears throat> We're going to try to move right downhill tonight. Uh, we'll start with number two. We have a public hearing consideration of fiscal year 2017-2018 budget. Go ahead. Well, Stephanie will just go through the presentation you're going to do for the public hearing this next week so you kind of have an idea what, what information will be in that summation. Also, just to let you know in your packet, um, there is a cover letter that goes in the budget document itself, um, which will be accurate as long as there aren't any changes made after we hold the public hearing. But uh, as of today, that would be the cover letter that will we'll go with our budget document. Okay, I'll just get started with the presentation. Um, basically, we just kind of do a recap of the whole budget, the proposed um, FY18 budget. So. This slide is just going to show you um, the comparison of revenues by the fund. You can see we, you know, have a pretty good increase compared 18 to 17, and basically those are in capital projects um, under business type. Um, sewer, um, so the sewer budget is actually 2.5 million dollars higher for 18 than it was in 17. Waterworks is approximately 900 thousand dollars higher. Um, and then in capital projects, obviously, um, later we'll go through all the different capital projects we have going this year, but it's an you know, increase of approximately six million compared to last year. This breaks down overall our revenues by what type. Um, you can see um, taxes um, basically are 31% of our budget. That's how we pay for everything. Of that 31% or that 20 million, 14 million is property taxes. The rest of that is um, a combination of like our lost property tax, our lost local option sales tax is approximately four million, um, hotel motels nine hundred thousand, um, miscellaneous revenues. This is a category that's set by the state's chart of accounts because normally a miscellaneous category shouldn't be twenty nine percent of your budget, but of what is included in miscellaneous is um, bond proceeds, and of that eighteen. 0.9 million, 16 million is bond proceeds that we will be borrowing in FY18. Um, the rest that makes up the miscellaneous revenue is sales and commissions. That's coming from like your um, auditorium, venue works. Um, donations make up another million. And then you can see it charges for service, which is also another big number, is approximately 20% of our revenues. Um, sewer makes up 8.7 million of that, and ambulance 1.1 million. Intergovernmental revenues are your grants, both federal, state, and at the local level that people contribute to the city. And if anybody has any questions as we go, please stop me. Um, this chart came right out of our open gov system. You can see that reference below. Um, so anybody can go out online and, and look at this and you can drill down and it will give you more details. Tell me again what of that tax, property taxes, how much? Um, property taxes are 14 million 14, of that 20 million. Okay. So then here is our overall um, expenditures um, by category or by program is what we call it. Um, you'll see those have increases too, pretty proportionate to our revenues increasing. Um, public safety, that increases based on the proposed, um, you know, increase in personnel for fire, police, and um, the inspections department. Um, the other larger increase um, business type is your sewer. Um, it increased about 1.5 million. Those are for capital projects we'll be doing. Water also had increased their expenditures by about 900,000 compared to last year. 
and that's in our budget. And then, of course, our capital projects. Um, those are for the, the flood mitigation, police building, street projects, which they'll be detailed out later. And then this is the snapshot that you can see from our open gov system, how it breaks down um, the expenses. Personnel make up almost 30%. Um, of our total budget expenditures. Um, contract services make up another 31%, and those are professional services. So a lot of your capital projects are broke down between engineering, um, other professional services we hire to get those projects done, and then um, our capital outlay, that's where you're gonna see those are our um, capital projects budgeted, that's 23%. Um, we have a proposed um, property tax rate of 40 cents, so this just breaks down the history of what we've done in the past seven to eight years of our increases where we've had them and where we've had no increase. And then I break down just an, a sample of a residential property that's assessed at $100,000 and calculate what their property tax will be um, with this rate increase. And so you can see it's an annual increase of $43.20, which breaks out to be a monthly increase of $3.64. Um, the increase is a combination of both. The rollback is increasing this year. Um, that increase is about 2%, 2.5%. And then our increase of $0.40 cents is like another 2%. Any questions on that? And then here I just did a sample. If you have commercial property assessed at 200,000, what that increase will be, um, they don't, there's no change in their rollback amount. Um, so they're gonna see a $72 annual increase with the property tax increase. Mm -hmm. And then <clears throat> what, we're, what is being added with the property tax increase is, um, I know we seem like we've talked about it a lot, but if other people haven't. Followed in detail, um, we're going to add two new officers. Um, their training and equipment that's needed, a patrol car for them, and a CID car um, for our um, detective, and one firefighter, and one part time nuisance staff. <laughs> this is just a breakdown to show um, of that property tax um, on this $100,000 house, you're going to pay $930 kind of just breaks it down by the type of expense where that money goes. Um, I didn't do any percentages, but you can see the fire um, cost you $176 for the year, police $284, um, debt service $216, that's paying off previous um, capital projects that we've bonded for. So this is just, and we do look at this net. So fire is less than police. Um, because we, the ambulance revenue is taken into account there. So, any no, questions? No, there? but I do like that. <clears throat> Thank you for the, for the breakdown. Sure. And then this is a sheet that we had included in your budget documents at the beginning. It just shows um, the, how we compare to other cities in Iowa with their population over 20,000. Um, and this was as of last year's tax levies. Um, one thing to point out is you'll see the lower taxable value per capita, where we are one of the lower ones. You'll see the other cities that are similar like us, they, we're, they're all in the higher property tax um, rate. We just need to unfortunately charge more taxes based on our valuation and our per capita. Do you have anything you wanna add, Jim? Well, it's very similar as we went through the budget process, we had the sheet that showed the per capita per person taxes that are generated uh, as a comparison between communities. And we were the, we're the second lowest uh, per person uh, proper, or tax collected. So it, we, it doesn't make it any easier for people here to pay it. It's just we're, with a given levy, we are able to raise much less funds than what our, our com comparable cities are to, to provide the same services. So I'll just go through some of the factors that are impacting the budget. Um, our valuation overall, our, the taxable valuation was up 2.48%. The TIF taxable valuation was down slightly by 3%, and then our regular was up 3%. So 
this just shows you the property tax amount that we're bringing in this year compared to last year. So the increase is partly due for the increase in tax rate and also the increase in the valuation. And I did want to say one of the things that I was confused by just going through what your presentation has been so far, you mentioned 14 million of property taxes collected and this shows 11 and a half million. The other two and a half million is TIF tax, tax collections, which is a separate bucket to, to fund TIF projects. You're right, in OpenGov it doesn't break it down that way. This is just some other information. Um, it's in the budget. We, our health insurance are, is projected to increase 3.9% this year, and we have it budgeted at 5%. IPERS isn't changing. Um, police and fire pension is slightly going down this year. And then this is a recap of our health insurance um, showing the last or next year and then the last four years. Basically, we you know have union contract language that our health and health, dental, and reserve cannot increase greater than five percent, or they would need to look at a plan design change. Um, so this is just showing you the caps that we could go to on family and single, and then also the contributions that the employees are making. And a reminder on the caps: those the the maximum amount goes up five percent each year. So as we're at 3.9 percent projected this year that means next year will there's the potential to see more in the six percent health insurance increase this is a recap just of the general fund revenues um, you can see the majority of what comes in to the general fund of course is the property tax 49 percent um, intergovernmental um, is another large one. Basically, that is showing a decrease um, in our budgeted amount. Last year, we had a bus grant funding um, in 17, and this year, we don't have that in there. Um, and you can see the increase in property tax is based on the increase in rate. Um, also, miscellaneous revenue is up that 200000 That's based on us budgeting different this year for the auditorium. I'm budgeting more revenues um, for the venue works and also more expenses. So when we um, put their um, financial statement at the end of the year into our books, it's more in line. And this is just showing our general fund expenditures. In the, so we have police making up 31%, fires 26%. They're the largest drivers. You'll see the increases from the prior year's budget. That's based on adding the new personnel. Um, you see the transit decreasing by that 283,000 that again is that um, bus that was budgeted last year and this year um, we do have uh, a transit bus budgeted to be purchased but we now have it moved back into our capital project funds instead of the general fund but other than that you'll see a lot of the expenses by um, activity are, are pretty stable again you'll see auditorium looks like it's jumped up a bit it's really overall the expenses net of the revenues aren't increased it's just the way we're budgeting so and then just another way to look at the general fund you see um, a lot of the revenues that do come in the general fund are transfers 7.4 million um, a lot of that's transferring um, our employee benefits levies into the general fund to pay for the benefits for fire and police and the other general fund employees um, lost is a big transfer into the general fund and then the transfers out of the general fund that 900,000 basically is the hotel motel by state law you have to receipt in hotel motel into general fund and then you can transfer it out into a separate fund um, but the good news is, is the transfers are down out of the general fund um, and that's based on us making um, the last of the deficit transfers in this fiscal year 17 so that's why you see that de decreased yay yeah, and you see we have a projected increase in the general fund of the 147,000. So, still increasing, just not a lot. Just to recap on the sewer fund, we talked about um, we're projected to have a three percent increase in the user fees. Um, basically, the same reason we've had in the past: the increased operating cost, and then 
the anticipation of future debt requirements to comply with the EPA sewer separation. Solid waste, we're doing a 25 cent increase. Um, so it's gonna go from 13.75 to 14 based on the increase in tipping fees and then our um, waste management fee increase. Here's just a laundry list of our capital projects, um, just so you can see. Um, we do have a busy year ahead of us. Um, the flood protection is the largest one at seven million. You got the police building renovations, 3.5, and then the, you know, at least three to four big um, street projects that will be going on throughout our city um, and the Mount Pleasant Street Bridge. Just a little recap on Hotel Motel. We have 900,000 budgeted in. Um, again, it's a split between, we, we get 70% of the revenue up to 700,000 and then 30% goes to the Convention and Visitors Bureau. Anything over 700,000, the city gets 60% and CVB gets 40. We have, um, even though we have 900,000 budgeted for revenue, our expenditures are 1.1 million. There are some account balances that have built up in those funds um, that we're going to spend down. Um, so you can see CVB will get 290000 Parks, we have um, RecPlex um, Shelter House going there, carts and mowers for the golf course. Um, the culture assistance, that's pretty much standard from what we've done in the past out of Hotel Motel. Special projects is where um, a lot of the revenues go, so you'll see the laundry list there, too, of um, the projects that we're going to do from those funds. <laughs> Anybody have any questions on these? I'll move on to the sales tax. Um, we're budgeting $4.2 million here, which is a slight increase, just 42000 from the prior year. I know in Jim's um, budget letter, he can kind of explain, we're kind of tapering off on these, um, the hotel, motel, and the sales tax funds from increasing as they have in the past. And then we have about the same amount budgeted for expenditures out of this fund. You can see the property tax relief, that's where that transfer will go back into the general fund, $2.3 million. Um, the officer equipment and to pay for the vehicles and the equipment, that all goes back um, to the general fund also. And a lot of the other things that, you know, we've talked about in detail. There's a transit bus purchase um, budgeted this year. Any questions on many of those items? So here's a good positive slide we like to yes. show. <laughs> yes. Here's just a recap of our um, deficit accounts and what the balances were in the past, you know, four years. So once we make the transfers for this current fiscal year, FY17, um, those will all be, all be gone. So. Thank God. That's awesome. Any questions on that? And here's just a recap of our um, projected um, legal debt limit. You can see for FY17, we are going to go up above the 70% that we'd like to stick to based on um, the larger projects that we have going on all at once. But then we're projected in 18 to fall back down to 66% of our debt limit. So based on this budget and these capital projects. <coughs> And that's all I had. If anybody has any questions, or and if there's any more detail you'd like to see next week, I can add it. I thought it was well presented. Okay, thanks. Uh, you guys, questions or comments? Mm -hmm. um, are we entertaining any thoughts of saving a few pennies on the <coughs> levy? Well, I mean, that's always up for entertainment. Is, that, is there any interest in me even talking about it? <clears throat> I'm ready to move forward, Jim. There's one. Okay. Anybody else? I'd like to hear your comments. My only, I, I still, when I started this process, 
uh, I had some suggestions for where we could save some money, and I still am at that position where I think we could save maybe four cents off our levy and make it up in the library fund. So I'm still in that position. But I know the rest of you haven't been really here to entertain that thought, but I still want to throw it out there. Five, I just want to throw five cents out maybe. Is that, I'm, that's my position. Does anybody else have entertainment that they want to? Okay. All right, then. We're going to move forward. Good. Um, thank you, Stephanie. Certainly appreciate all the hard work. And Annette, thank you. Uh, next, we have a motion for preliminary adoption of the second reading of an ordinance prohibiting the const uh, Constitution. Prohibiting the construction of wells within the city limits for use of potable water source. Mr. McGregor. Um, yet again, this is uh, an ordinance that would restrict uh, non-potable wells in the area of south and uh, I got corrected on the potable potable. <laughs> um, <laughs> Thank you. Well, no, I wasn't correcting you. Sorry. Um, That's all right. It's, uh, it's, a, it's an area to restrict um, because of the free agents that are in the dirt. Um, uh, DNR's recommendation to do this. So, if there's any questions, I'll answer those. Do you guys have any questions for Nick? I don't. No. We can waive the vet rating. I think we can. Um, you guys give with no, that? No reason. Yeah. Yeah. See any reason not to. Okay. Uh, number four resolution approving bond purchase agreement for general obligation corporate purpose bonds, series 2017B. Steph, who's, who's doing it? Jim? Um, this is a, we're going to be going through the process of selling $10 million of bonds right at that amount. Uh, $2.2 million for the police department, the other $7.7, $7.8 million in that range for a combination of pro projects, the flood wall being the primary piece. Um, the other components are, are three separate TIF projects, the roundabout at West and West Burlington, um, Agent Street, Agency Street West of um, Roosevelt and Agency Street East of Roosevelt, uh, setting funds aside for all three of those projects. Um, Travis did plan on being here this next week. Uh, their goal for next week's session will be to present the, the actual sale number, sales numbers for you to accept at that point uh, with the interest, whatever the interest payments are going to be off of that schedule. The, the actual bond repayment schedule is already set for that, uh, working that within our, the portion that's backed by geo debt is worked within our existing debt levy that we're trying to maintain and move forward. Okay. We good? Good. All right. Uh, number five, resolution approving white boxing at Depot for Greer's Restaurant. Matt Murray called me and asked if we can leave this till the end of the meeting. He can't be here. Uh, he's at work and, and uh, till then. We can wait. Uh, next, we have a resolution approving a memorandum of understanding between Des Moines County, Des Moines County Secondary Roads, and the City of Burlington for the construction of Madison Avenue. <clears throat> Yes, I'm, I'm Bob Wright, the uh, city engineering manager, and I just wanted to clarify that memorandum of agreement is on Madison Avenue south to, uh, forgive me, from Kessner Street to uh, Nakona Place. So they estimate that at uh, about 66000 our share, 50%. Uh, and we'll work closer with them throughout the future budget season so this doesn't come as a mid-year you know surprise yeah. how far south does this go uh it's uh nakona place In nakona yes that's okay. our responsibility they estimate 50 percent of that section is our responsibility but do you know how far out the, are they going to go all the they're way going the much further down all the way out i think all the way thing. yeah I think all the way. okay sure needs it they split it sure out does. three different yeah. divisions there yeah okay yeah you guys good yes yep. it gets me Play Paid out of a miscellaneous street account. Needs yes. to be done. A player to be assigned later to cover the, de the deficit on that. <laughs> um, fortunately, we have enough in road use tax to cover it, but that is a discussion that 
I asked Nick to have with the county to make sure that as they're doing these projects, they don't just drop them on us. Uh, that, that, yeah. that he's in, and knows what's going on with them and can get them incorporated into the budget. And someone may have been been informed, but it certainly didn't get passed through the system. Um, purple and gray looks good there. <laughs> <laughs> Way to pay attention to detail. All right, uh, number two. A resolution approving an agreement with French Renneker Associates to perform construction staking uh, for the roundabout intersection at West Avenue and West Burlington Avenue. Welcome yes, back. I'll address that as well. As okay. far as this is the uh, construction surveying and staking for the West Avenue, West Burlington Avenue roundabout uh, fixed fee there of $20,800. This uh, enables the, the actual design firm, French Renneker, to do the staking uh, ahead of our uh, bidding and construction. You guys good? Okay. Now the actual construction oversight is something you'll do internally? That is correct. We'll do that internally. Yeah. And the, uh, yeah, the uh, concrete uh, inspections. You feel good about handling that? Yes, sir, I we do. We feel good about you handling it. I feel good about it. All right. <laughs> Thank you. And we've done a lot, a lot of these projects in the, I mean, we have a different setup this year for how our projects are proceeding. We, we're using a lot more outside engineering firms. Yeah. Um, and just, it's reflective of the, we're trying to do it internally with staff that, with too few staff to do the work that was necessary to do it all internally. So things were continually falling farther and farther behind. Uh, in an effort to try to get caught up, uh, they're doing, trying to figure out where are the spots that they can cost effectively, put their time and efforts into buying down project costs, Good. and yet still farming out uh, a lot of the work. And this is an area where specifically the roundabout that we wanted to stay as much out of that as, as we could use someone who's had experience with that. That's good. Sounds, sounds smart to me. Are we good? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, number three, uh, we have a resolution awarding bid for construction of home at the south southwest corner of South Fifth Street and Maple Street through the neighborhood st uh, stabilization program. Mr. Tisley, um, this is our project through the NSP uh, program. Uh, we received bids at the end of last year, uh, three bids in the amount ranging from 132,000 to 170,000 for construction of a new single-family home uh, at that location. Uh, we do have 141,000, over 141,000 in NSP funds available um, and would recommend going with uh, low bid Flint Creek construction for 132,000 to construct a new single family home. Uh, we do have an identified uh, purchaser that'll, um, that's on the list for set date that'll come up at the next meeting uh, to do a purchase agreement with. Um, this is a three Good. bedroom, uh, two bath home uh, at that corner and the purchaser does have to meet income requirements and other uh, requirements of the NSP program. But uh, since we do have an identified purchaser, we can go forward with the construction of the home, and this will be okay. uh, the last pro uh, project through the NSP funds. This will probably close out the, the program after this home. So, Thank you for clarifying that with me. I, I, did, I didn't understand what was going on there. Um, Flint Creek is... Where are they located? Where is They're place? out of Burlington. Burlington. Yep. Good deal. Yep, we have two Burlingtons and one Sperry for the bidders, so all good. fairly local. Good, 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 good. Eric, as that goes to sell to the person buying it, that's based on their ability to pay? Their ability to pay. They have to qualify for a fixed rate mortgage, and then they can only pay a certain percentage of their actual income, and they have to be below 50% of the area median income. So reduces their ability to actually pay for a new home considerably based on their income and then they have to qualify for a fixed rate home and then it's a certain percentage of that. So um, we sell the, we will be selling this house for considerably less than what it actually costs to construct but that's part of the NSP program, the requirements for that. Um, but we just finding someone that qualifies for a mortgage, a fixed rate mortgage, making 50% or less of the area median income was uh, a challenge, but we did uh, find a qualified buyer on it. So. That's a good deal. Are we good? Somebody's going to get a nice house, aren't they? Thank yeah. you. I'm looking forward to moving in. Number four, uh, resolution approving. Sorry, resolution approving renewal of taxi cab vehicle for hire license for Tennessee Mains doing business as Yellow Cab Company. 
Any problems there? No, it's no. just a Okay, good. Uh, next is resolution approving amendment to the terms of Otter Island lease agreement. Mr. Tisman? Um, some of these changes came forward previously um, after discussion. Our city attorney drafted some language in items number 14 and uh, 15. Um, there was some discussion with the um, Riverfront Advisory Committee as well as council uh, about the lease amounts. And this did go for further discussion by the Riverfront Advisory Committee on February 13th. Uh, they recommended approval um, five to one of the current lease agreement in front of you. And I would, um, so a couple of the other changes was uh, making that they recommended was uh, making the fee uh, non-refundable um, upon payment to the city of Burlington, as well as uh, having the site numbers visible from the Mississippi River affixed to the structure. Um, was discussed on the um, fee rates. Uh, Going, uh, the one that did not vote to recommend approval of this wanted to see it doubled immediately. The rest were uh, more comfortable going gradually. Uh, this change has the resident uh, fee uh, lease amount go up $50 annually and the non-resident uh, lease amount go up $100 annually. Uh, one note they did want to see was in the August 20, 2021, have the non-county resident be 1200 instead of 1100 That would essentially double it within that time period, but it would increase the last year by 200 instead of 100, so. You guys good with that? I'm not good with the uh, fees. Um, I think we discussed as a council that we would double those uh, in this year, if I remember right. Go up to uh, 500 for resident and 1,200 for non-resident. At least that's what I remember recommending. That's, yeah, not right. an un, that's not an unreasonable. Right. Did they, did they explain why they wanted to go with this versus? This was presented to them as a, on all of our leases in the past, or a lot of our leases, we've had a gradual increase um, for individuals that aren't aware of a lease increase doubling, although may seem insignificant, is still an impact to them. And um, so bringing that in gradually is what past practice has been. I don't remember saying that we were going to raise it. I don't remember saying double right off the bat. But, uh, if, if there's a desire to change it to, as a, as a group to see that be a, an immediate double, but I mean that can be, yeah. be modified for your consideration this next week. That's not at all unreasonable. I mean that's uh, pretty prime riverfront property if you've got a boat. Pretty cheap. Three hundred dollars is still a bargain. Cheap. Still cheap. Three hundred dollars is a bargain. That's for sure. Five hundred dollars is a bargain. Yeah. So it's twelve hundred if you don't pay taxes in the city of Burlington. Yeah. I'm fine with it as is, but we'll go with the. Let's. Are, are, do you guys want to change that? Do you guys want to have that change for next meeting? Um, I don't know. I mean, I can see both sides where raising it all at once is like a bit of a shock for those people who have the lease and are. But I do understand that it's also not that much for a year. So I'm kind of a bit I guess, torn. I guess if it would go up $100 a year instead of $50 a year, that would get us there quicker and it wouldn't be as much of a shock. But at least it would get, yeah, us, I can support that. Would get us to somewhere it we want to be. It definitely should go up. There's no question about right. that. It's just so if, if we said August of 2018, it would be uh, 400 the next year would be 500. Non-residential is already going up 100. Yeah, so it would make it 150, let's yeah. say. Yeah. I can try <coughs> a little bit better. But what's the maximum we want to get to is the, is the final question that we need to ask. 500 and 1,200 what I mentioned before. Okay, so then if you By did, 20. if 2018 was 400, then 2019 would be 500, that would, that would get you to your max. And then if you did, um, so it'd be 850 and uh, 950 and then 1100 the following year. So is that okay with you guys? I'm fine either way. Do you have that, Eric? So just by, by what year would you like it to be that double and then we can 
just are you guys saying by next back. year? No. By, no. By 2019. So still by the same timeline, though? By 2021? So, no, yeah. it would be 2019. By 2019, okay. have it double. Okay, we'll put that, factor that in, what that amount is. Is that all right? Yeah, it's yeah. fine with me. Is that okay? That's fine. I don't think that's unreasonable. Okay, you good, Mr. Tesla? Mm -hmm. Eric, there's additional language in there in regards to the property needing to be able to pass an inspection. Right. Yeah. Do you know how that works for as we enter this August where that has not been part of the contract language before and you have, have a couple of properties may not pass that inspection? How, did, how are they treated? Or is that something that still needs worked out with the attorney? Well, it does. Uh, state condition shall be rectified within six months. Uh, so they'd so have that to begin they'd have with. Six the months beginning. to begin with, and then we'd go back and inspect it. Okay, we good. Yep. So are you, 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 you going to leave that on the consent calendar? It's okay with me if you do. I, I, I say we. Everybody's fine with it. You might as well just leave it on there. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, next is uh, A, consideration of a purchase agreement for, uh, for the property located at the southwest corner of South 5th Street, Maple Street, City of Burlington, with, with condition, uh, conditions for March 20th, 2017. Mr. Tislin. It's just a set date that will have more details on the individual that's looking to purchase the home as described previously. Um, we have a consideration of a permanent encroachment agreement with Greenway of Burlington Associates for encroachment into Valley Street right of way at 2312 Valley Street, Burlington, Iowa, March 20th. This was discussed previously at Stone Garden Apartments. Uh, some had some further discussion and some modification to uh, the gate on Valley Street and bringing that back with some additional conditions on it. Good. Uh, then we have consideration of an ordinance vacating a portion of Ganon Street and Whitaker Street right of ways adjacent to the property located at 1104 Ganon Street, Burlington, Iowa. Again, uh, set date for uh, property near Brockway, uh, mechanical uh, west of uh, Osborne Street, looking to vacate some roads that they only have ac or they have property surrounding and adjacent to, so no other access to. Uh, and then we have uh, consideration of an ordinance vacating the alley running from Columbia Street to Washington Street between Front Street and Main Street, Burlington, Iowa. It's the alley. Uh, Drake, uh, the Drake restaurant owns the property completely surrounding uh, that alley, and they've requested to vacate it. And then we've got a hearing for consideration of designation of Deer Point Estates Urban Renewal Area and the Urban Renewal Plan and Project for April 3rd. So. Big fun. All right, uh, moving to discussion items. Uh, Treasurer's report. Okay, January's Treasurer's report was in your packet. Um, I don't know if you guys looked through it, had any questions that I can point out a couple of things like. The flood mitigation project, when we bond for that, that won't be a deficit anymore. Um, same with MASL project, we're going to cover that. And the other ones that are running deficits right now are like our um, property maintenance yeah. and um, vehicle maintenance, and that's because we're always a month behind in billing out those services. And then, of course, the golf course and the recplex, which we talked about earlier, that we're going to make transfers to cover those. I don't know, Jim, if you, there anything that you wanted to point out? I mean, the biggest deficit account, I think, on there in the capital projects mm -hmm. is uh, flood the, mitigation. The what? Flood well, mitigation. Flood mitigation, that's 200000 That mm -hmm. has, that has, I don't think we, we, we haven't received any payments. We have yet. not. We, and we don't know how much we're getting yet for our t tax increment. No. Um, the other is the dresser ran cleanup at 633000 or so. Um, that still hasn't hit a uh, closeout on that project. I assume that they still have some seating to clean up yeah, the, yep. as the season. Mm -hmm. um, if we get 60 degree weather again, um, we'll do a transfer. We've got the, the ability, we've certified the debt, and that'll get covered with TIF funds. And our hope is that we have that project closed out by the end of the year and can 
yeah, cleaned they have up. To seed in April generally. Those are the I think the ones that stood out to me. Yeah. Um, and that there's no um, none of the expenditures that look like they're out of line compared to what your ideal percent is. Looks no. pretty good. Well, building code seventy percent is. It looks like we're in pretty good shape. That's though. and that for Eric, I think building code is that some tree contracts that you've had that mm -hmm. you front loaded the cost. Yeah. You've yeah. done I think like eighty thousand out of a hundred and ten or something okay. like that. Yeah. All right. The other one was um, insurance. Well, and we pay insurance all it's at one, one time, so it's an annual okay. payment. All right. You guys satisfied? Thank you. Okay. You good? You good? Awesome. Okay, uh, next we have an Apollo School Redevelopment Proposal, FGP Development. Mr. Mayor, City Council. Oh, you broke the mic. Yeah, I know. Uh, Jesse Caston, Terrace Real Estate. So, Zach and I uh, both were tasked with uh, getting this property marketed. Um, there's been a little bit of information out there. I thought I'd clear this up a little bit that it's been on the market for a couple years. We actually had it on the market for three months. So as, as you guys remember, we were here in the fall. Zach uh, was really saved it. So um, anyway, so it was a three-month process, ended January 21st. It was an RFP process that we went through. Zach, uh, I believe a couple weeks ago, I wasn't here, but kind of went through um, all the developers and uh, users that we sent it to. So this is the second of the uh, two proposals. Uh, so FGP development, Nick and Russ. Take Do you guys have any questions for me? No, just thank you. Thank you, Jesse. <coughs> uh, Mr. Mayor, members of the board, thank you for the opportunity to present our project tonight. And, uh, we look forward to uh, continued discussion. Um, just like to get right into it. Um, introduce, or, introduce yourself. Oh, I'm very me. sorry. I saw the last video and the same guy did say that. <laughs> um, Nick Gody. Uh, FGP development in Anaheim Housing out of Des Moines. Thank you. I am here with my uh, partner Russ Frazier, and our other partner Brian Phillips was unable to make it tonight. Uh, but FG, FGP development is a coalition of three partners: Russ Frazier, Nick Gody, myself, and uh, Brian Phillips. Um, a little bit about us. Russ has served as the president of Anaheim Housing for approximately seven years. Anaheim Housing is a nonprofit real estate development company. In Des Moines, Iowa, it's a nonprofit. We focus primarily only in the Des Moines area. Um, Russ has taken that program from around 300 units when he took it on to over 600 right now, and we anticipate to hit the thousand uh, units under management uh, by the end of, the, of 2017. Um, I'm Nick Gody. I serve as Anna Wim's director of property development, and I've been with Anna Wim for approximately two years. Uh, prior to that, I served with another nonprofit developer in, in Des Moines, uh, focusing in market rate housing and retail uh, development. Um, and prior to that, I was actually with Terrace Real Estate Group for a little bit with Jesse, uh, serving as a commercial real estate uh, property manager there. And Brian Phillips, uh, he's uh, much of the financial support for our organization, and, and Russ and I are providing most of the experience in the development area. Uh, but Brian's no stranger to real estate. He's been in the transaction services business for over 30 years as a real estate broker. Uh, many of them now with Terrace Real Estate Group, and Brian's had a vast experience between industrial, agricultural, retail, multifamily uh, transactions, both lease and sale. Um, to discuss a little bit of our experience, I mentioned, I wanted to go through a few projects that I mentioned in the documents you've already received. Um, prior to today, today, but uh, talk through a few of the projects that we have worked on or currently working on just to show you the kind of breadth of experience that we've gone through. The project you're looking at right now is the Fort Des Moines uh, uh, historic site uh, on the south side of Des Moines. We are part of a, a co-development of this project. Uh, as you can see, six buildings. It'll end up being 142 units of the former uh, stables and housing sites for uh, Fort Des Moines. So if you were a nurse or uh, a black soldier in World War I, you were, you were going through Fort Des Moines uh, pretty much regardless of where you were in the United States. Um, 
This will be a similar type of capital structure that we're proposing for uh, the Apollo site. Uh, it'll be low-income housing tax credits. It'll be historic tax credits, both on the federal and state levels, enterprise zone, and uh, traditional debt. Uh, I guess Brownfield credits are involved in this as well. Here's an example of the existing structures that are in place. Most of them have been vacant for a number of years, if not decades, and uh, haven't been placed in service for quite some time. You can see uh, good examples of the housing on the top uh, left and the bottom two photos, and then one of the stable pro uh, uh, buildings on the top right there. Uh, this is a project called Madison Flats. It's one that I completed when I was with Neighborhood Development Corporation. Um, it's a 30-unit market rate housing project. It was the first of its kind on the south side of the river uh, in Des Moines, just directly south of Principal Park. Uh, the top left photo um, is the site as it was prior to redevelopment. This is a brownfield site. We also used uh, uh, enterprise zone tax credits and traditional debt. Uh, again, it was 30 units, all market rate. Uh, we ended up hauling about 200 loads of dirt from the site to a site in Nebraska because no sites in Iowa are able to take the level of contamination. And then wow. we backfilled the site up about approximately seven feet. Um, so we're, we're no stranger to uh, difficulties along with projects. Um, it's actually uh, kind of helped uh, and, and the purpose of a neighborhood development was to catalyze other development, and it has across the street in, assemble, in a site that I helped assemble on about f uh, five acres is about 250 units of more market rate housing in the, in the city of Des Moines, again, straight south of Principal Park. Um, the top right and lower left are some photos that we had taken, and then the, uh, the lower right, which unfortunately you never know how it's really going to turn out in the group setting. So it's kind of a little hard to see, but it's a sample of the interior of one of the units. Uh, this is a project that we just closed financing on and uh, will start, start construction here in the coming weeks called Legacy Park. Uh, what we essentially did is recapitalize a portion of our portfolio, uh, uh, over 137 units, 51 buildings, and 41 parcels. Um, there's a mix of single family, duplex, uh, three, four unit uh, type of building all the way up to the apartments, the buildings that you see here. Obviously I couldn't put everything in there, but uh, we have a few historic structures where we decided not to utilize the historic tax credits on those. This will be a 4% a, a low income housing tax credit project alongside tr uh, traditional 30 year debt. Um, so, uh, to talk about the project team a little bit, obviously, um, you know, I'm not one that sees the world you know, circulating around myself, but as the developer, you are the center of the universe and everybody circulates around you and you are responsible for everything that everybody does. So there's a number of important players that we have involved uh, that, you know, we couldn't do the project without. Our architects, Shift Winter Associates, has done a number of historic rehab projects. Uh, as long as well as LIHTC projects and they're at the, the top priority list of, of people that we need to work with on the project. Uh, a close second is our general contractor, SS Construction. Uh, they've been a big help leading up to now uh, and helping us establish uh, the prospective budget guidelines that we need to work from. Uh, civil engineer, obviously, we, we want to look to work with somebody local uh, that has more familiarity with the code, with uh, the people that we need to deal with at the city level. We'll be working with the National Equity Syndicator, approximately 32 syndicators throughout the United States that uh, we'll try to get the, uh, the best deal with on, on our uh, tax credit price. <coughs> uh, Love Funding will be our debt provider. They're out of Columbus, Ohio, and they'll provide the, uh, the HUD debt product that we'll be utilizing on the project. We're deciding between a 221D product or a 223F. Um, State Historic Preservation uh, Office in Des Moines, obviously, we'll be interacting with them very uh, regularly and, and um, they'll be an important part of the process. Iowa Finance Authority, uh, they'll be regulating the uh, tax credits and tax and bonds that we'll be utilizing. Um, obviously, the property manager is a long-term risk mitigation source and I'll talk specifically to that in a little bit. And obviously, the city. In any project that we do, we need to work closely with the city to make sure that 
both goals uh, goals of the city and the, and the project are being met. Um, again, a little bit about property management. Property management represents the single most or the single highest level of, of risk for any project as, as, as an asset. It's a financial asset at the end of the day and investors need to make a return. Um, in our particular case, the financial rewards are, are less concerning as we are with the, uh, with the uh, requirements imposed upon us by the federal government, the state government, and all the uh, funding sources that we'll be utilizing. So we'll be wanting to utilize a highly experienced, highly reputable uh, firm that specializes in low-income housing tax credits so that we can make sure not only we're meeting the, the basic minimum requirements, but we're constantly fostering a good uh, uh, rapport with the, the community that we work within. Um, you know, in the event that we have a poor uh, property management uh, scenario on the project, we risk the long term, in the long term, having to uh, basically cut a check back to our equity investors in the form of what we call credit recapture risk. Um, part of the property manager's responsibility at the basics are going to be criminal background check, rental history, uh, references from other landlords, and then uh, we have the requirements of the financial uh, underwriting for each individual tenant as we'll be serving tenants that are at 60% of area median income uh, or slightly below. I'm not sure if this is going to work and we'll see if it does, but uh, it's, a, it's a, a, you know, right now drones are, are the fun thing to play with and so we had SS Construction, uh, they offered up to head down to the school, take some drone footage, and, and it's a quick video on, on uh, the school itself. There is some music, but it's okay that it's not playing because it just, it didn't really add that much value to it. <laughs> so I'm sure nothing that you uh, haven't all seen before, but you know, what the verbiage that they put in the, in the video really expresses what we're, we want to do here is preserve the history of the building, but really put it into the 21st century of, of uh, <coughs> what we want tenants to be able to live in and providing safe and affordable and decent housing. I think you're wrong. <clears throat> I think the music really would have added to the effect. <laughs> <laughs> well, the music that they had in there, I'm not so sure. <laughs> well, we can move on. seem to get, I think it might have started over. Okay. Okay. I don't know, can you progress it to the next, oh, thank you. So uh, we studied the site and the historical drawings that we uh, received uh, as part of the RFP and some digging that we did. And overall, we'll, we plan on uh, completing 77 units of those uh, 12 studios, 31 bedrooms, 23 two bedrooms, 11 three bedrooms, and uh, likely one four bedroom unit. And the mix of unit types will be varied on each floor um, and throughout the, the entire project. Uh, we won't be utilizing the auditorium and or nor the gymnasiums. Uh, we will be re rehabbing the auditorium, the gymnasiums, but uh, both of those, or I guess all three of those spaces will be utilized as community space. Uh, we, we look to try to engage the community on utilizing those spaces or providing workout areas for the tenants. Um, you know, in, in some of the hit digging that we've done, we'd like to reach out to some of the past uh, potential users of the building. Uh, I understand there was an art program um, and some of the other potential community users that we could partner with. So. The, the, the space isn't essentially sitting there collecting dust. We really want to be able to showcase that, case that space. All the apartments will come uh, standard amenities of appliances. We'll have, the, as I mentioned, the community space. There is actually green space within the building that we'd be able to create. Well, not within the building, but within the confines. There's a, a courtyard. Uh, we'll provide two-to-one parking and uh, standard internet access for each tenant. Uh, again, showing uh, the layout of the, of the of the units. Um, again, the center blocks that you see there are unutilized. The bottom one is the auditorium, and then I didn't show the gymnasiums on either side. And then the upper block, 
that's blank uh, is the courtyard area and also um, I can't remember what else is specific in that space, but uh, that was the lower level uh, that we'd be able to use. And we were really happy to see that we could actually utilize the lower level of lots of tall windows for egress and um, a lot of good usable space down there. Um, we'll have some remediation obviously to do uh, potentially mold and other things and things to do to make sure that the build, there's areas in the building that don't have water problems in the future, but obviously that's all back, uh, put into the construction schedule. Again, the first floor and the second floor, I don't know if we need to spend much time unless somebody has some specific questions. Um, project sources. So you can see we have a total budget of sources of uh, just over 16 million, six of that coming from low-income housing tax credits, uh, about 650 coming from workforce housing credits, uh, state and federal credits at around six million combined, uh, 2.6 in a 223F uh, loan, and then the proposed 100% 15-year TIF. On the uses side, we have acquisition uh, at the proposed 100,000, construction of 12 million, and the remainder of uh, professional fees, interim fees, financial fees, all the things that comes along with the architect, the engineer, uh, the origination of the debt, uh, the variety of fees that goes along the bond inducement, and things like that. So I, I'd like to spend a little time just you know making sure that we have a, a good idea of what light tech is and what light tech is not because I know it's not everybody's favorite discussion in, in the in the uh, in the boardroom but obviously uh, you may know it was established in 1986 and it was really established as a replacement for public housing which was failing in many cities and uh, Chicago being one of those uh, good in or bad instances of failure. Uh, it's dictated by Section 42 of the tax code, and I wanted to point out the difference between the 9% and the 4% tax credit. Uh, my understanding is that previous projects have been uh, proposed for this building, uh, but those have been utilizing the 9%, which is a competitive uh, uh, source of funding that, you know, for this year, for example, there is about 25 applications put in for the 9%, and we anticipate probably 10 to 11 being awarded. Whereas we're utilizing the 4% tax credit, which is a non-competitive uh, source of financing, obviously less, but it'll be used in conjunction while we will have to uh, issue, have um, tax exempt bonds issued through the Iowa Finance Authority. And so the, the source of that 4%, as long as we meet the basic design requirements and income requirements, that'll be a sure source of financing. Uh, we'll be serving tenants that uh, earn 60% or less of AMI, uh, and in Burlington, Iowa, that's uh, approximately $38,000 for a family of four, uh, and that actually represents about 30% of the uh, the folks here in, in, in Des Moines, excuse me, that's, that is a Des Moines County number. Uh, what it's not, it's not a grant, it's not public housing, it's not the, pub, the projects. So all of our tenants, you know, they'll have to have a job, they'll have to have a source of income, assets, uh, and it's really designed to be a step up versus, uh, you know, a long-term handout. And we help those folks to kind of transition through that portion and time of their life. Uh, here's some examples of the tenants that we'll be serving that we, we have in our existing portfolio of tenants. Uh, nurses, teachers, bus drivers, janitors, hotel staff, uh, fast food workers, waitresses, and gas station attendants, just to name a few. Uh, these are all people that we need to uh, kind of function in our daily economic lives and uh, that level of income doesn't always provide them the best opportunity for safe and affordable and decent housing. Uh, a lot of times we get a question about, well, Nick, you just listed all these sources. What about your skin in the game? You're, develop you're the developer. Shouldn't you have some skin in the game? Well, our skin is really the long-term risk associated with the operations of the property. And in the, in the sense of the LIHTC world, we're going to sell the project to an investor, but they're, and they're going to own approximately 99% of it, and they're going to make us retain 1% ownership so that we have a long-term responsibility associated with that property and to make sure that it's managed well, it's cared for, we're a good uh, uh, community partner. Um, again, I mentioned the recapture risk. They have us there for the... the uh, uh, performance assurance and you know we're also responsible to the IRS, IFA, SHPO, MPS, our National Park Service, Iowa Department of Revenue 
in our equity <laughs> source. So we, we have a long-term responsibility for earning that, that developer fee. Uh, here's a timeline of the project. And due to the nature of the funding sources that we, we would be going after, uh, there is uh, you know, a little more time that I know that I think some folks here would like to see. But uh, with this setup of uh, sources, we can have a, a good level of assurance that we'll be able to complete the project. So uh, we're assuming in March you all are going to be making a selection of who the developer will be. And at that point, we'll start what's called the Part 1 Historic Tax Credits. As you all know, um, it's not yet in the Historic Registry, so putting it on the registry will be part of that. Based on the experts that we've talked to, we, we feel there's a, a very good chance that it will be put on the register, and then it'll comply or it'll uh, qualify for what's moving forward in the Part 2, which is really the design aspects, making sure that there's a, a substantial rehabilitation on the building to warrant uh, funding the project with those that credit source. Um, and we move forward to the LIHTC award. Mm -hmm. Along the way of us doing these other parts, we'll be working on a LIHTC application and award and the things that go along with that. Uh, we'll plan on closing the uh, partnership in December and start construction uh, January of 18th. And then we anticipate uh, around a year uh, for construction to be placed in service in 19. So I know there's a few more slides there. I just kind of put them there just in case there was other questions. But I know uh, it's a comp complex process, and, I, and I'm hoping that I can answer any questions or objections or anything that uh, you know we can use our time. With. Questions, Council? Well, my main question was, and you answered it about how how you're going to get those tax credits because, like like you said, the last group that came here, they weren't able to get those tax credits, but. You answered my question. Yeah, and that really has to do with the timing, and it's really tough with a nine percent project on on commingling that with a with a historic project. Mm -hmm. So, nothing else. Yeah, we got please. a three-hour drive back. You might as well <laughs> <laughs> we say well, like, make one additional comment to, to Nick's uh, comments because I think we appreciate and uh, your willingness to uh, to hear our proposal and you know, we have the opportunity to work uh, regularly with uh, hundred plus year old buildings and they come with a challenge uh, every <laughs> one of them and uh, this one is certainly no exception and I think our our thought to it is that uh, to look at the investment that I think is going to take to get this building done, it's going to come down to what is it really, what's the per unit cost of what it's going to take and the reality of it. Doing it well, doing it well and doing it right the first time um, is really where I, I think we would encourage you to, uh, to focus your, your decision. That, being said, it doesn't necessarily have to be our proposal to that. But look at the big picture and the long-term investment you want to see on that property. Doing a piece at a time or, you know, I think what we're looking at is a, a big, large-scale effort here to bring it all back into a condition that the community can be very proud of. And so uh, I think that's probably the challenge that we would like to leave with you is the thought of bringing this full, the level investment we're talking about here and uh, the full resources that we're going to take to get it to, to get it to, to that point. It's going to take some resources. Thank you. We appreciate you guys coming down. Thank you for the presentation. Thank you. And yeah, the tentative, uh, kind of our goal from a staff perspective was to put this back on uh, next work session uh, for a chance for you to think through what you've had for the proposals from the two different firms. Uh, allow you to have some discussion about what you liked or didn't like about the different ones and if you're at that point comfortable making a decision to move forward with one or the other or or to decide not to work with either of them and and to look for an alternative avenue um, if we're able to get get through that meeting and you have a selection that you want to move forward with um, I think that's going to involve setting a public hearing on a urban renewal project um, it'll have a the soonest that I think that we could get anything where you'd have the public hearing held where you can do the notification process would probably be the first meeting in May. 
is my guess, seeing how timelines have worked on other projects. Um, so we've got a, a ways of time to, to work through this if, uh, if you do end up moving forward with one of them. Okay. And I think we have all of your contact information um, in case we have any, anything thing that the council comes up with, we can get it forwarded on to you to um, make sure that any questions that are sitting out there get addressed. Sounds good. And we appreciate you coming up to do this. Anna, Anna Wim is a neat, a neat program, uh, very somewhat familiar with the work that you do up in Des Moines. Um, I know this is on the side and not part of Anna Wim, but you come from a, a good background. I appreciate that. All right. On that note, let's finish on a good one. Gas up in Burlington, not West Burlington, on your way back. We appreciate that. All righty. Okay, uh, next we have an uh, animal ordinance, pot belly pigs. Major Grimshaw. Council Mayor. Darren Grimshaw, um, I was asked to do a little bit of research and look into the idea of an ordinance that was proposed by Christina Hancock, I believe, about a month ago. She'd approached council and asked if there could be a review of ordinances allowing for the ownership of pot-bellied pigs, miniature pigs, or micro pigs, as they're referred to. Um, I've done quite a bit of research. Uh, I'll give you some information, kind of give you some insight into some possible ordinance ideas, uh, some of the information that I've found from other jurisdictions and how they've handled this issue in the past. Um, but just to let you know, uh, first of all, pot-bellied pigs, because there is quite a variation um, originated in Vietnam, uh, the pot belly pig, but there's been variations since then. Uh, the micro and mini pigs are sometimes a cross of breeds, um, but typically the pot belly pig or the pet pigs uh, weigh, um, they're advertised sometimes to weigh 20 to 30 or 40 pounds, but more than likely, uh, the average is anywhere from 60 to 200 pounds is the weight of these pot belly pigs. A pot belly pig can get up to 200 pounds larger yes so currently we do have an ordinance um, in Burlington that restricts livestock uh, to include pigs or porcine uh, swine uh, inside the city limits um, so that's part of the reason why Ms. Hancock came to the City Council is because she has an interest obviously in owning a pet uh, pot-bellied pig as a pet um, our current ordinance does not allow for that unless there's an exemption by the enforcement officer or the animal control officer that obviously answers directly to the chief of police um, for a livestock exemption. That's an application that's done. And through that process, the person that's asking for the livestock exemption uh, would have to have their residence uh, inspected. Uh, they would have to uh, make sure that they meet certain conditions as far as um, elimination of animal waste, uh, proper housing conditions to make sure that they eliminate uh, the concerns of noise, um, smell, um, anything that might affect neighbors, and then they would have to conform with the other stipulations of the current animal control uh, ordinance. Um, state code uh, does not recognize or differentiate pet pigs or pot belly pigs from other livestock. Uh, a pig is a pig to the state of Iowa. Um, we have to be cognizant of that, obviously, because of law enforcement's role if we assume responsibility of those pot-bellied pigs, whether through abandonment, uh, stray, if they get loose, law enforcement and, and, and uh, animal control obviously would be responsible for containing and housing the animal. Uh, typically, our Local ordinances um, around the state vary, uh, but I have found um, through numerous different cities that I've spoken to, both in Iowa, California, and in Nebraska, um, law enforcement's typical response was we didn't know we had a pot belly pig ordinance, uh, meaning that they just don't have a lot of issues or concern with it. Um, however, they did make comment that typically what they find is it's not the responsible pet owner that understands or has done research on a pot bellied pig that they have the problem with. It's the one that thinks they're cute when they're about three weeks old, 
that now six months later or a year yeah. later realizes that that eight pound piglet that they originally bought now weighs 160 pounds and is ruining all of their furniture in their yard. Um, but with that said, there are a number of local ordinances that uh, have a lot of good information contained within them uh, that obviously could be considered. Um, law enforcement's concerns obviously are what do we do with abandoned pigs or pigs that all of a sudden get too large or too cumbersome for the people to manage. It usually falls on the hands of uh, the Humane Society, animal control, the animal <coughs> shelters, and law enforcement. Uh, so those are obviously issues that we need to consider. Um, I did have conversations with our local Humane Society. They are not interested at all. Not that they have any opinion one way or the other. Uh, they know that pigs have been uh, known to make very good pets for people that are responsible and understand what it takes to own a pot belly pig or a micro pig, um, but they do not want to have any involvement with the housing, care, adoption of pot belly pigs or micro pigs. Uh, that does bring up one other issue that we need to be aware of. If we do come up with abandoned or stray pot belly pigs and our pets, um, we have to conform with state code, and more importantly, um, we would have two options then if the owner could not be located, and that is either through a uh, rescue service for potbelly pigs, which there are some, they're limited, uh, or euthanasia, obviously. Um, so those are considerations, um, but the Humane Society is not willing to take that on themselves. And then, of course, the other big issue of concern is veterinarians. Uh, most of the ordinances require that the pigs are annually certified by a vet, that they're spayed, neutered, um, that they are uh, current on their vaccinations and that they meet certain height or weight requirements in order to meet a city ordinance. Um, typically, a lot of uh, jurisdictions don't have the veterinarians maybe that will specialize or take pet pigs into consideration. We do have two veterinarians here in Des Moines County that will uh, give vaccinations and, and care after and give authorization and certification to pet pigs. Um, currently, um, our local ordinance that we have um, with a few modifications I think could work for those that have researched it and want to own a pet as a pig or a pig as a pet um, that they could make application to the city of Burlington through our enforcement officer animal control and through the, the uh, chief's office uh, they would have to show that they've uh, they have proper facilities proper fencing proper uh, housing for the animal uh, that it meets the uh, current restrictions as far as distance from neighbors or residences um, and uh, some of just the basic things that uh, need to be considered obviously um, the fact that miniature cute pigs at 10 or 12 pounds grow up to be 50 60 80 200 pound pigs um, they're very very smart uh, they learn quickly um, they tend to manipulate owners that aren't well versed on how pigs um, handle themselves. Um, obviously, if, if you live in a condo or an apartment, they recommend not owning a pig. Um, they have to be outside a lot. Uh, their natural tendency is to root. Um, but apparently, they do make good pets. Uh, but there's a lot of arguments whether or not you should have them around small children, around large dogs because it's kind of a predator uh, prey type situation. Um, that's kind of a quick overview of the pot belly pig inquiry, uh, kind of what we need to maintain and, and uh, look from a law enforcement standpoint and from a city of Burlington standpoint of view on what happens if the pigs are abandoned or left stray uh, and we come across it because then it would fall into our control obviously. So there's, those are some of the answers I, I hope kind of make it a little clearer. Uh, like I said, I think our current ordinance with a few modifications uh, would allow the city at least to make sure that we don't have someone that's housing a um, 150 pound pet pig if they live in an apartment or a condo, uh, or that they do have yards and facilities and understand some of the circumstances that it requires to own a pig. Are there cities that have enacted special ordinances for this issue? Yes. Um, I talked to the city of Des Moines, um, Tumwa, Fort Madison, uh, Bellevue, Nebraska, 
um, I don't remember the name of the city out in California, but they have specific pot belly pig ordinances. And a lot of those ordinances restrict the numbers, um, the height, the weight, the annual certifications, what's required, um, how you can lose that uh, certification on an annual basis. But a lot of it is to the specifics of if you're going to own a pig, it might be up to 120 pounds. Anything larger than 120 pound pet pig is not allowed in the city. Uh, people know going into that. The problem is they're marketed much smaller. They're marketed as micros or minis and you go home thinking you're going to have a 40 pound pig when it's fully grown and two years later you've got a 180 pound pig in your house and that's sometimes what happens but um, apparently every, everything I've learned and everyone I've talked to so far have said that they can make amazing pets but as long as the owner understands what they're getting into and they fully realize what they will have living with them. What, just, uh, just talking to you, I mean, if, if you had to, uh, to make the call your own self, what's your, just coming from, you know, Major Grimshaw, what's your recommendation looking at all the moving parts and the variables? What, what, do you, what does Major Grimshaw uh, say about that? Personally, I don't have a problem with someone that wants to own a pig as a pet. Um, there's a lot of positives that people have talked about. Um, from the city standpoint of view, as a major at the police department, uh, I think just a couple of modifications to our current existing ordinance um, could be presented to council. Uh, we could make that change and use our existing ordinance uh, without actually creating a separate ordinance for the ownership of pot-bellied pigs. Um, and what would the part of that requirement would be the person that wants to own a pet pig inside the city limits would have to make application to the city through the animal control enforcement officer. Uh, that would be reviewed where they live, their ability to house for and, and care for the animal, and then certain stipulations would be, probably would be my recommendation. What about, since, the, since uh, this, but th this is kind of a special deal though, so, I mean, so much so that we've got to have in writing special, uh, um, a special special verbiage so what, what do we do if, if this happens or that happens so I mean if, if it's going to be that much extra should we consider extra expense if we're going to consider this I mean as, as far as because it sounds to me like it's going to be a lot more trouble if something was to go wrong I'm just just trying to look at it yeah most like I said most cities that I talked to law enforcement wasn't even aware that they had a special ordinance uh, back in the 90s uh, Pot-bellied pigs became kind of a fad pet. Uh, that's when they were introduced in the United States in the late, uh, uh, you know, early um, 1990s. Um, since then, it's kind of fallen off. I think a lot of people started realizing um, some of the difficulties of owning a, a pet pig. Uh, like I said, there's very responsible owners out there that, that get along fine, uh, but they are much different than dogs. Uh, I don't think there's a big cost that we would see. I don't know that we would see a lot of applications uh, for the pot-bellied pig, uh, but it would give us uh, an opportunity to review where the person lives, what their opportunities are for providing housing, a yard, proper fencing, um, and to make sure the person has researched the idea of owning a pig. What's our, what's our, do you know what our, our our structure setup is right now if someone was to have a pig and they didn't go through the proper the proper channels and they, uh, they would just be found. violating a city ordinance that prohibits livestock from being housed within the city limits every once in a while we'll get uh, especially on the outskirts of the city limits uh, we'll have someone that might want to keep chickens they might want to keep maybe a, a miniature horse uh, we've had applications over the last 20, 30 years from different residents looking to maintain livestock within the city limits. But um, I'm not aware of anyone that owns a pot-bellied pig currently within the city limits. I know of several people that live in the county that own pot-bellied pigs, but not in the city. As, as pets? Quasi as pets. Yeah. Hey, since, I, since we brought this up, though, I just need to add to get this squared away. You can have chickens in, in your house in, in city limits? You have to have a special authorization for that. Yeah. All right. Any other, any other so questions? Does, does that take care of the potential pot-bellied pig problem? 
Are you, are you going you? to add some more peas on that? <laughs> <laughs> Probably. <laughs> Potentially. <laughs> there you go. Are you guys good? I'm I'm happy with his recommendation that if we want to do it, we just add some Modified to our current to our right, current yeah. code rather than try to come up with a whole new code for the whole thing. Yeah. Yeah, and it wouldn't be an all encompassing people would have to apply. Yeah. Right. And have to, you know, pass. So I think that's a good idea. That's what I was kind of afraid of, was that we would have this ordinance and then people would just get pigs willy nilly. And, and even if you um, Every ordinance I came across requires an annual certification and inspection of the, right. I mean, they have to, there's certain things, they're going to jump through probably more hoops to obtain a pet pig than they would a pet dog, mm -hmm. but there is a licensing you go through and an annual sure. certification and vaccinations and, yes. Man, that was thorough. Mm -mm. You're good, my friend. Thank yeah. you. I'm Thank not you, getting one. Thank you, Major. No other questions? Thank you. No, okay. Thank, Thank you. you. We appreciate you, my friend. Um, we've got, let's go to, uh, since Mr. Murray's here, we'll go ahead and let you, uh, we'll let you come now. This is a uh, resolution approving white boxing at Depot for Greer's Restaurant. <coughs> Did you, uh, I don't think that we have anything from a staff perspective to really add. We've did sit with uh, Matt last week and just sort of talk through um, our uh, what the proposal was. Um, I think that there is some willingness if, to have some of the items that are included in the white boxing proposal. Um, some of those items maybe be taken on by the, the tenant, uh, but to also have a credit assigned within the rental terms to try to compensate for that for some of those things that could potentially move in there we mentioned um, the drywalling and some of those things that finishing off uh, the interior that could potentially been, be done like that but I think those are some of the do smaller dollar amounts in terms of what the overall cost is one thing to mention from what Nick presented with a, up to 146,000 that was recommended that um, the council sent to economic development suggesting that they look at that as a funding source and they approved. Um, when Nick developed that cost estimate, that's an, he tried to build in a contingency to cover the unknowns that can come up in this process because a lot of this is going somewhat off the cuff in terms of that line placement, this new sewer line to be created. Um, you don't know what what might come up in those kinds of things. So he wanted to make sure he had a number that was high enough that y you didn't get part way through a project and he has to come back and say I was wrong, it's 15,000 more than what I originally said. Um, and he also, I think, kind of wanted to stress that he's not looking to spend 146,000 if it can be done cheaper. Um, that being said, this, this was uh, an item that uh, the council showed uh, favor towards back in August, showed favor towards in J January and recommended it go to economic development. And uh, things have changed in the meantime. Uh, this last vote was a 2-2 split. Um, uh, I have a question. Where, where is that? I know the answers to these. But where is the money coming from? This is out of, we have a, an economic development sub fund within local option sales tax. Mm -hmm. uh, that fund has about 300000 at the end of this year total. That, uh, so that's it's set aside to do, and, I mean, we've done, the, the primary project that's been done out of that over the years, the biggest one that's taken the most money has been Dresser Ram site, uh, paying off that project from back in 2006, 8, 2008, before us. Uh, but, um, so, but basically then, granted this money the does come out of the budget, it is well, an undesignated 70, right, 70,000 kind of goes into this savings. Council always has prerogative to, to make adjustments to mm -hmm. what you do over time with priorities. That being said, as you have discussions about 
uh, items such <coughs> as adding the public safety, mm -hmm. this would not necessarily be an offset. It wouldn't typically be considered an offset to it just by the nature of where the funding is. It's a cash balance that's sitting there. Now, part of that, though, was uh, as we dealt with economic development in the budget process and trying to figure out how to match that out, uh, the economic development fund did have a $20,000 annual cut right. to its allocation. Um, so you could, I mean, technically you could do, have considered more than that if you were doing it, but that was not part of the process to get to a balanced budget, it's, right. which is to your point. Right. Um, so, but basically this money is kind of, to put it simply, in a savings account that money has been allocated over the years. Yes. Okay. So I guess now my question is for the, the, the individuals who voted against it. What was, can you reiterate your reasoning? No, I don't think I need to do that. No. Okay. Oh. <laughs> no, I, I, I'm glad, man, I'm glad you came back tonight because I guess last week I really didn't explain myself well. And I, and I want to say this, I wish your son was here tonight. When I said no, it's no indictment on you as a person. No indictment is you as a businessman. I, I think uh, you're a winner, and it's not personal feelings. If it was personal, I would have said yeah and hello just because I like you. I think you're a winner. That being said, I have to step aside with personal feelings the same way that I, that I stepped aside with my personal feelings when I said when I voted yes for the, a tax increase. I did that, and I didn't like the verbiage. I didn't like the way it was written down, say, knowing that I'm saying yes to a tax increase, and here we are where I didn't have protection on that line or on the, on the amount. My understanding was that even with the $146,000 that there was no guarantee that it wasn't going to keep climbing. So, so maybe I had a misunderstanding, but if we can get the verbiage right, um, I'm, I'm still not against a uh, white box in the building. It just seemed like it just started climbing. It started at 75000 and it started climbing. And for me to be okay with, with okay in a number, especially after saying okay to a tax increase, at that time I didn't like the way it was written. I wasn't okay with going forward with it. But um, again, I just want you to know it wasn't anything personal on you. Uh, again, I think you're... Uh, um, I think you're one of Burlington's finest. I mean that. And personally, if it was personal, I would have said yeah a long time ago and just walked away from it. Uh, again, can't make decisions that way, and I just want to make that clear. But um, I, I support what you're doing. So I didn't feel comfortable uh, at that meeting. Right. So basically, you, the reason was because you were afraid that it was going to grow and grow, and even though was, even though the was, economic development um, they only uh, up to 140. I don't know. Was it was it written that way at, at the? It's an up okay. To, well, okay. It's an yeah. Up to so I, you were afraid that it would that, go past well, that. Well, again, I was going in saying that with the recommendation. I spoke with staff's recommendation. Mm -hmm. They said seventy. They felt comfortable with seventy-five thousand dollars, and I was okay with that. With with white box in it. That was the original. No, am I no. saying that wrong? Yeah. yeah. I don't think that staff ever came up with this. Matt, Matt had was, a $75,000 figure, and the first number that the that staff ever came up with was, was more like a 120 to 150. I, th and I thought the original to number was they would that that uh, that our, our responsibility was going to be. <laughs> Somebody broke that initially. Originally, let's get that fixed. My original number was 151,400. So this number has actually come down since then after a discussion with Where was Matt. the, where, okay, where was the $75,000? That was the developer's uh, number. And when that was provided, <laughs> that when that was provided, we, we did stress that we didn't have anything yet, uh, that, we, that we hadn't evaluated that. And there were some things that we thought were going to be higher than that. Mm -hmm. but I've, got, I've got original notes of me saying, I, uh, <laughs> Saying I'm all in at seventy-five thousand. I don't know where I got that. From. Uh, so the seventy-five thousand that you got was probably back in July. So this has been going about a year. Back in June or July, there was an LOI that was drafted uh, by Mitch Taylor, and they in that they asked for seventy-five thousand dollars for capital improvements to go towards the white boxing of it. So there was a rent in there. There was a seventy-five thousand that was asked then. But that was before the city went through to see the sewer line and everything else. So that might be where the 75000 that you're talking about from. And, and with that, when we got to August in that time frame, you, 
part of the, what the council asked for then was for us to look at what it was going to take to truly do the project because we didn't think that everything was included in that LOI amount. And, um, and I don't know who said what in that meeting, but the proposal that came forward was asking us to put $75,000 towards it. As, and during the discussion, uh, it was modified into us taking responsibility for getting it to a white box uh, position as opposed to giving him 75,000 credit towards the project. We'd cover the white boxing he would have a separate lease, but we needed to get those costs, which we didn't have developed until January. But regardless, okay, it's, okay. Okay. it's still at that, we're at a point where the, the original number that Nick was able to put together was in that 150 range, and that still had, was a very tentative number. Um, well. He pulled a few items out, and it, it does include the 20% contingency because we do right. recognize and it. Again, if, uh, if you're good with it as it's rewritten anyways, it doesn't matter. So we don't have to waste any time. We can just keep rolling. Or is everybody else good? No. Um, well, I guess I would like to know then what Jim's original concern was. I just, I just kind of want, because there seems to be a huge confusion, both here and in the public. So that's why I'm kind of trying to really dig deep, is my only reasoning. I go back to my original point. If we're going to have the place, I don't, it doesn't matter who's going to be in there. If the way it is now is just an ugly appendix, and so um, if we are intent on developing the depot and or selling it, and that'd be my first preference. If someone would step up there and buy it, that'd be great, Mr. Murray. You could be certainly welcome to buy it. Anyway, hey, there's a thought. Uh, <laughs> yeah, the line starts right there. I'll get, get in line, folks. Anyway, maybe Mr. Trayman wouldn't like that idea. But um, I'm, I like to know what the terms of, of a potential lease is going to be. Mm -hmm. that, that's kind of my hang up. Um, Hundred thousand dollars is kind of my my limit too. That's kind of what I'm thinking. I guess my why. If it's not coming, if it's coming out of the economic development fund. But it's still our money. It is, but yeah, it is yeah. going towards a good, either way, whether we sell it or not, yeah. it would be much more desirable if it was white box or had yeah. repairs done to it, basic maintenance that see, see all that. citizens are expected to conform to. Mm -hmm. That's another point, too. If we're going, if we're looking into what, I mean, what are we going to do? If we're looking into selling it, why, you know, don't we want to limit the amount of money that we put into the building? Why do we want to sink money into it? We're going to turn around and sell it. Uh, to me, I'm not. I'm not catching the. Well, that's the point. I would want to spend as little as possible on the building if we're trying to sell the depot. If we're going to keep it and develop it, that's that's kind of. I what can't I, imagine my anybody buying it. But are we? Tim, you brought that up. I know of our considering selling the building, right? I. Uh, I think we should sell everything that we do that we've got so that. We can uh, uh, lower our cost of operation on an, on an annual basis. Getting rid of the depot is is uh, but one of those those items. Um, uh, when you improve a property, it increases its value, um, and we don't know. That you, you made the comment right there. You don't know that we can even sell that property. Um, I I think uh, we shouldn't. It would be my opinion that we should make the, the improvements as we have, as we are able to capitalize on the private sector in, in investing in the, in the building and doing what's necessary to uh, white box it is the terms that we've been doing uh, so that we can take part of the public's money and then part of the private sector to make it a, a functioning building again and then and then move on, or we should uh, tear it down. Um, and I, th and that's that's not going to be a popular choice at all with with uh, all. anybody, especially um, Amtrak. And once it's once there's a, uh, I I think <coughs> that once we sit down and seriously consider marketing it, just like we did the Apollo building, that uh, and that we put together an incentive package, that we have an opportunity to. To sell the building, and if there's a tenant in there, it's going to make a buyer uh, much more enthusiastic about purchasing the building when they know they've got some 
ready rent coming in. Um, or, or that's the last thing the buyer wants in there because he wants to turn it into who knows what. I mean, that's that's an assumption you're making there. That well, that, the, no, that's the, a businessman's that's a businessman's uh, uh, preference. I mean, I'm, I'm to do what to have tenants in a building that if you've already got income coming in, and um, I think I mean, that depends on what you're going to do with the building. That's oh, I, I'm yeah, I'm <laughs> sure that that's depending any anything could happen, Bob. Yeah. But I think from a business person's <clears throat> perspective, if there's an incentive package and if there's already a tenant in there, I mean, if the if Amtrak had an office in there, I'm sure that there would be a lot more people ready to jump on yes. it. Yes, um, but we've we've not been successful at that, and the private sector has been so. Well, Tell me about the rental income. Yeah, what kind of re lease agreement are we talking about here now? Kind of depends, but Jesse, could you kind of give us an idea of what we could potentially... You want to let Matt talk first? Maybe and then we'll talk about that. Sure. What, in regards to... So, uh, well, I'm going to go back to the July uh, proposed amount when it was a $75,000 capital that was gonna be put in by the city. At that time, it was a proposed a lease of $1,250 a month. So it was probably get over a five year term, which is what you'd be looking at for a lease. Basically half of it was gonna to go to the capital and then the other half would go to cover because there is gonna be, there's not currently taxes on the building because it's city owned. There will be taxes, it will be put on the tax roll. Right. So there will be an increased cost there. Um, be an increase in the operations. Um, you know, for, for the city standpoint, uh, like janitorial, that's kind of been up in the air. I think that, you know, Matt, and I don't want to put words in anybody's mouth here. That's why I thought Matt would go first, maybe. Um, but the janitorial, I think they were talking about maybe they would take care of some of the, you know, restroom maintenance. And because when you have a restaurant, you're going to, they said all these costs are going to be increased. But uh, in the July, it was June or July in that proposal, it was $1,250 a month and then the $75,000 capital investment. Now a market rate, if you have a, just a, if you had a pure, a spot that was white boxed, ready to be used, um, what would be a decent lease amount on that space in that location? So here's the tough part, uh, is that that, that space is a uh, thousand square feet, right? Or 1222. 1222, hundred and square. Uh, so if I tell you $10 gross on a lease price, that may include a, a space that's 5,000 square feet, so it's a little easier to amortize those costs that's going to go into 5,000 square feet compared to 1,000 square feet. So that's where the, you know, the tough part is for me just to say, yep, this would be the, the market rate uh, for a restaurant space of 1,222 square feet in town. But I guess my, my thought had been that you're probably realistically that is about what you would rent space for if you were going to find a spot that had been rehabbed and was ready to be occupied. Yeah, I, I think it's really going to come down to that capital improvement that uh, you know is, is asked and is going to be put into the facility. But about fifteen thousand a year revenue. So that's where you got seventy-five thousand. And <clears throat> if it's fifteen thousand a year revenue, maybe in that neighborhood. I mean, that's where you're talking about. Is that good enough to justify the you're spending 146,000 to generate 15,000 of annual revenue um, plus pay the taxes plus plus pay the taxes it doesn't yeah. cash flow for us but part of the 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 decision you have to make as a building owner who's got a building sitting vacant and underutilized and in, and in need of being rehabbed is do you feel that it's it's worthwhile to do that or not um, those are hard decisions, and you five have very different opinions about that. Yes. Well, um, and the, the, the other issue, part of it I see too, is all right, so we put $147,000 in there with no flood protection. Now what? What about flood protection? As we're, we, we're not going to have no flood wall down. As, as we built. As we talked tentatively last year in the lease terms, um, it talked about us having the responsibility to take the efforts that we were set up to do. So prior to uh, the, the flood wall 
project down around the depot isn't designed until I think 23, 2023. Mm -hmm. Up until then, you've got a, a buyer beware in terms of a, a leaseholder coming in and or, or leaser coming in and, and, and renting that space because we're not taking responsibility. Right. Wow. Now, even after that, we have the responsibility that if I'm reading that contract right, or the proposal, that um, we have a responsibility to put in the flood protection efforts that we said. When a flood occurs, part of that is putting the HESCO barriers around the parking lot. Um, we do have that responsibility. If we don't take care of that, I think we have liability on us under those terms. But if we do the protection that, we ha that we're set up to do and you still have a flood event occur, you're fi I think that's an in between insurance companies on who covers what. But we're certainly living up to our expe expectations on that. <clears throat> but we could, in theory, though, once the flood wall gets put in place, we'd have extra HESCOs available to we'll have use them someplace. We'll have so. extra HESCO barriers. <laughs> and if you, the, that, the project that goes there, the, I think the high water mark was maybe half a foot into the building. Is that anyone here long, been here long enough to know anything? 12 or 15 inches. 12 or 15 inches. And I think the, the wall, the, that, that was sort of a berm that they were looking to put on the east side. And I don't remember the design work on that, whether it was a couple of feet or if it was a three foot no, wall that, or what. That was enough to go down. Two foot. Two foot. So that's going to be a, per, a permanent thing done on the east side. We have the ability to, to do it on the on the west side, but part of I mean part of the concerns that I would have from for Nick's crew with this the flood wall that you're doing twenty two hundred feet lineal feet the whole thing or for, for the whole thing for the flood wall. Well, it's a lot. it's a lot. It's over there. Um, you got he has a he has a lot of flood wall to put up in a during in a flood event and it they're talking they were talking about two days to do that two full days to put that flood wall yeah, up and maybe you have the ability to have a separate crew that's doing the hescos on the other piece at the same time until we get to that we don't know exactly yeah. how that flows through but you know it's this is still gonna it's not like this is gonna be not no more no more time intensive thing to put flood walls up once we've got this project done is that fair kind of fairly, fairly. <laughs> you're allowed to point out when i'm wrong matt you want to you want to come up and say anything you can you want down here <laughs> probably matthew murray 2050 highland so um i guess i i I'll start here, um, as it's been pointed out. Uh, we've been at this probably longer than most people have. Uh, I'm going to pat myself on the back. I've been I've been patient. I've been encouraged. Um, you know, even uh, Councilman Fleming, you said, and I quote, "It's not a matter of if; it's a matter of when." And did I, I say that? Yes, you did. <laughs> um, you know, uh, it's. You know, so all along, it seems like the process has moved along, and I've come here and, and, and trying to work with council, trying to be cooperative here, not necessarily coming in here wanting everything for myself. I understand that the situation that the city is in, I think uh, Councilwoman uh, Wilson and uh, Mr. Scott, uh, along with uh, Mr. Freno and the staff, I think found an equitable solution by going to economic development, obviously, by me standing up at that podium talking to them was under permission of council. That means at least a majority of you voted for that. If you had concerns, why was I even talking to you? So obviously at the time, the number 146 was out there. They saw the relevance in it. They saw the importance in it. Former mayor sits on that. He said that he's been at this thing way before long he wants to remember and wants to get this depot project done. Now, in exchange for this, Okay, we've been talking about what's the city commitment. Well, what's my commitment? Quarter of a million dollars of private investment going into this. When you took a vote a couple nights ago, if that vote would have turned out differently, I had right then and there, three investors were promising willing to sign over $60,000 worth of their private money for the funding of that. Now it's on hold. I have a gentleman in California who was formerly from Burlington 
when I wrote something on this on Facebook a long time ago, he got in touch with me and said, I think you have really a neat project here. He says, all I want to do in return is I want something to signify down there to represent my family, a memorial. What he would do is pass through money to Friends of the Depot up to $75,000 for grounds improvement. When I told him of the council's decision on a 2-2 vote, he said, my commitment to this now is in question. $325,000, council, what we're looking at here for up to 146000 in your property. I've had people say, Matt, continue to fight for it. Continue to fight for the depot. And I'm like, shouldn't the city be fighting for this? Isn't this your property? Isn't it in your budget that you're just going to pass a part-time nuisance inspector? What's the job of a nuisance inspector? The whole private citizens like myself accountable for their property. Look at the depot. Broken windows, heaving cement, it's dangerous. It needs to be fixed one way or the other. If I'm in the, in the picture or not, it needs to be taken care of. It's a gateway to our community. When people get off from the West Coast, from the East Coast, and they stop in Burlington, what's the first thing that they see? What's their first impression of Burlington? Now, you walk into the great room, and it's fantastic. But keep in mind, this is the hard work of these people. These are people that are willing to donate their private money to get nothing out of it to showcase our depot because they're proud of it. Is the council proud of their depot? Are you proud of your community because you have a citizen here that has decided to stay in Burlington to invest his own private money <coughs> to put my own house on the mortgage because something I believe in. I would not be standing up here after a year and a half of time if I thought that this thing was not going to work out. The mayor gave me a compliment, said I'm a good businessman. I hope so. Because I'm not doing this simply just for the passion of the depot. I'm doing it because I think it could make money. It could be a tremendous partnership between the city of Burlington and Greer's LLC. So I guess you've got to ask yourself, you know, is it worth it to you? You know, is it worth it to you? I promise if you have faith in my proposal, I promise to be a good tenant of that building. I will do things right now that's probably not even getting done. I know myself because I guess I do it around my own house. You know, I plan on wanting to do some landscape. If it has to come out of my own pocket, I'll do it. Or if this gentleman in California comes through with this money, we'll do it together. I'll be out there every single morning probably sweeping cigarettes up, butts up out on the platforms when people are waiting for the train. And keep thinking that in mind too. You know, for a long time, people would go down there and sit at that depot waiting for Amtrak, which is never on time, and where do they go? They sit outside in a rail yard. Now we got some beautiful stuff going on in the great room, but, you know, what's it for? When you got a north and a south end building sitting there vacant. You mentioned flooding. Aren't you, even if I walk out the door right now and say, listen, I'm washing my hands with this, I'm done. What are you going to do with the great room after all that grant money has been spent? All the people that have donated $10, $100, $1,000 to go to the depot, go to the great room, are you going to let it flood? Are you going to HESCO barrier? I mean, I think there's some, some heady questions beyond me. I am just happen to be maybe a peripheral vision right now, you know, either in council's way or hopefully embracing council. Can I ask you a question about your Please, Mr. potential operation? Um, what, how many seats in that area are you anticipating again? Can 45. You Sorry? 45. 45, okay. Intimate setting. Very, yes. I was trying to figure that out the other day when I was down there. I thought, where, is it, where are all these people going to sit? Well, we'd have to uh, make some modifications because you know, if you don't mind, just brag a little bit about it for a second. Well, and I thought maybe you could set some tables up out in the great room that would expand your... Uh, you know, well, we thought yeah. about that. I mean, obviously, I, I, you know, you know, excuse, you know, I, Officer Grimshaw was talking about pop pelly hit. Let's, let's kill one pig at a time. I mean, because I actually, I, I thought about, obviously, you know, wanting to maybe sometime do that. When you, if you floated the idea about, would you want to buy the depot? Well, 
I might. But this is a first step. Okay. So, I mean, I mean, I think the great room has tremendous potential. I mean, right now, wedding receptions. I mean, yeah. you know, whatever it may be. But this this is another step in its in its evolution. Yeah. You know. Okay. Thanks, man. Everybody's good. Thank you. <clears throat> I just wanted to add a, one other thing, Mayor. The improvements that the city's going to make through the white boxing are 40, 50 year improvements or, or longer. The, the uh, sewer that's in there has been in there since the, since the day the building was, was uh, built. The, uh, the electric that uh, is going in there is going into a panel. All the, all the other electricity that will go throughout the building will be put in by the developer, not by, the, not by these funds. It's just brought to the panel. But improvements like that is, are, are long-term improvements and will probably be there and usable long after, long after Matt's gone. And I don't mean long after he gives up business. I mean long <laughs> after he's gone, period. Oh. Um, and uh, I'm sure long after most of us are, three of us are gone. Um, I, I think... Uh, Me first. Speak for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Clean living. If, if you're going to live more than 50 years, God bless you. But uh, it's gonna, that's what it's going to take. I'm working on it. That's um, cool. <laughs> and uh, I, I think we need to keep that in mind. We're just we're not doing this for Matt Murray. We're not doing this for a restaurant. We're doing this for the building and whatever potentially might go in there. And it, it'll be it's long term investment. It's not a it's not a 15 year investment that the time that it would take to pay it off by paying twelve hundred and fifty dollars a month. It's <clears throat> you know, Mr. Davidson, I appreciate your sentiments. And as I told Mr. Fano and Mr. McGregor, I said if they can do it for fifty cents. I'm all for it. You know, um, just don't tell me the project's dead. I'm willing to work with the city because I believe in it. It's not unhinged passion, just blind ridiculousness, just doing something. You know, I've sat in that seat. I know, I know what's going on. And, you know, I'm willing to work for the city, but give it a chance. Give this a chance. You know, I, I think in the end that the, the vote that you make, either consensually tonight or next week, I think you're going to look back at this and you're going to say, you know what, it was a difficult decision, but it's something that I'm glad that I that, that we did. Uh, you know, and I just, you know, can't encourage you enough. <clears throat> you know, not take a leap of faith in me. Take a leap of faith in the depot. Take a leap of faith in its history. Take a leap of faith in our community's history. And I think that you're going to be proud of what you did. <coughs> Excuse me. Are we good? Are you guys getting enough information so that we can? We don't want to keep dragging this in. Okay. Thank you. Man. Thank, Thank you for coming down. Thank you, Matt. Appreciate that. Thank you, Jesse. Thank yeah, you, Nick. And thank you, Jesse, as well. <clears throat> um, number four, Mount Pleasant Street. Mr. McGregor. Um, as we're beginning the design stages of, or not beginning, we're in the middle of the design stage of Mount Pleasant Street, the uh, overlay project between Roosevelt and Gear. Um, it was a combined STGB at that time um, grant application. Um, I, I was talking with uh, Jim about the reconstruction of what it's going to be, and I don't know that you guys know what its plan was. Um, currently, it's a four-lane road. Um, in the grant application, it is proposed to go down to a three-lane road with a turn lane road in the middle um, and then a bike lane. So I just wanted to let you know that that's what the plan was. Um, I assumed you knew that. I didn't know that until I, you know, we started getting to design. So. From how far to how far? From Roosevelt all the way to Gear. No. I don't know if this was ever presented to the council <clears throat> like that. 2012 or 13. Roosevelt to Gear? Yeah. I, Great. It's a, now, it's a combined project. With for, for West Burlington, we, we question whether they were on board and what were their comments? They were on board. Dan has been you know, reminding them that that's what this is. Uh, Mr. Gifford has been reminding them that's what this is. And so. I haven't reminded you because I didn't know it. <laughs> until I didn't know it either. <laughs> To be fair, so I it, it is going to be a change in what people's traffic patterns are, 
um, you know, you will no longer have the opportunity to drive in two lanes. It'll just be one way, essentially, one lane with the center turn lane. Um, is, so the whole of Mount Pleasant really then comes down to from current to Roosevelt's the only four lane section. And, well, I guess up by North Hill School. Now. Correct. It goes back yeah. to four lane after Mount Pleasant. And this is similar, really, as we look at Mount Pleasant Street Bridge, as we're doing the design work on that, that's yeah. taken that to a two lane with a bike lane. Uh, a, a, a wider, wider sidewalk wider that, sidewalk that could be bike. potential as a bike lane. Um, it, it, it would be barricaded sidewalk, but you know, <clears throat> I don't really know when they when they narrowed, they tapered the, the bridge down for traffic load. Um, yeah. But that will be the permanent plan moving forward. It is, it's a lot cheaper to, to just have two lanes of and, a bridge rather than the four. And when, we, when he's talking about the, this project coming up, it causes me consternation. But at the same time, it matches your complete streets philosophy that you did buy on to here a couple of years ago. Um, I mentioned to Jason Hutchison with the chamber, and from his perspective, just off the cuff, he wondered about with shears and traffic flow out of there at, at shift change. And I think that, I can't remember who mentioned, possibly having to see about making an adjustment to trying to get traffic to uh, go at the, the four, there's a four-way stop over to the west mm -hmm. of there. But Broadway. just, Broadway. just Broadway. Broadway or Broadway. West Burlington? Yeah. Broadway Street. Their, yeah, lot, doesn't, the their lot doesn't function <clears throat> off of that, and I don't know if it could, but this is something that we wanted to at least get out here for you to start it, It's about a big change. I mean, it's it's a long stretch of roadway. Then that is a long get stretch a, of roadway. That's, it, I think it calculates to be out about two miles. Going from four lanes to uh, two. It, it is. You know, there is a lot of safety concerns well, three, that, are, three, safety I mean, well, that comes yeah. with it. Yeah, but three lanes, right? Three lanes with the yeah. center turn lane, correct. Yeah. One lane each way. Right. Well, that's pretty much two. You can't drive down the center the whole way. So, uh, no. any Nick, questions for uh, Nick? Did last time? week. It hasn't been. What are you talking about? Why? It hasn't been an issue where we are with the, from Curran to the Mouse Pleasant Strait Bridge. No. Not that I know of. No. But we don't have a shear. So and that's a different that. traffic load. Yeah. There. Oh yeah, that's different. Yeah, it definitely moves from an arterial street in, in the capacity where we are changing it down to more of a residential. What, what about for uh, traveling with uh, emergencies and uh, have, have the, fire, the police department, fire department, what do they got to say about that? <clears throat> I like four lanes. I don't, two lane stuff makes me nervous. Well, since we haven't experienced it, I'm just not real familiar with the bike lane and exactly how that's going to work. You know, Mr. Davidson made the comment, but that stretch of road does not include a bike lane. That's so I'm, true. Yeah. I'm just not real sure how it's going to work. I know it's, it's working really well in other communities. And, and at the staff meeting, as I was talking, I was the one talking about shears trying to get out, especially that traffic trying to turn left. Mm -hmm. yeah. Some of that traffic's been resolved because they built a new parking lot where Baldwin right. Brothers used to be, and they go, they walk underneath the overpass. So that traffic has a chance to get out at the four-way stop. But but that was a concern. And, I, and as far as the bike lane, I just I think it's, it's successful in our communities. I think it's just a big adjustment for the people that are traveling on that roadway to be aware that, hey, you know, you really seriously are going to have to share the road. Because I think people will take advantage of that bike lane. I truly do. Thank you, sir. Yep. <clears throat> are we good, guys? Or we get any other information tonight? Jim? I guess as we talked about what do you do, um, it, if you didn't like this, it's I, I don't like it. What do we do? I don't know. Seriously, probably wouldn't like me here saying this, but <clears throat> eventually the striping will go away. Um, the, the asphalt should last longer than the striping, so you could probably restripe it. But <laughs> don't let them. But part of the what we did talk about was, and that why he's saying it that way. Um, when you when you set, submit a project like that. And they score it. They score it for safety. Correct. They they, they score it for safety, and then the, the bike lane is also a safety factor, but also a recreational factor. So it scores you towards the hot, the top of the list. And so if you were to do it in a in a manner differently than your application, the funding might get pulled. 
Um, and so that's the fear of changing it, you know, changing the way the grant was written. Um, and I don't even know the dollar figure on that grant either, off the top of my head. I don't um, have But a it's problem. a significant amount. It's. I don't have a problem with what you The problem is we just haven't been communicating yeah, it. I, and, and I don't know how much West Burlington's been communicating it. Not enough that it's publicly, I don't know how much I've heard. But. I don't have a problem with it. I do, but. Uh, if everybody else is groovy with it, it doesn't well, matter. Well, you have some time to think about it. It's not like we're anywhere. No, construction won't happen on this until late summer. Um, but if you were to not want this to happen, we'd have to, I think, yeah. figure out some way to get out of this project. Yeah. Correct. Very soon. Yeah. yeah. I'll tell you what. I'm just saying concrete. It's not forever, but it's a process, and it's expensive not to, not to make it forever. You know, I mean, once that... And so those roads are there. I mean, and this would this would be an asphalt overlay. This would be a mill and fill. I would appreciate that. There's, too, there's not. There's no. Uh, in other words, there's no uh, widening or narrowing no. of the current Correct. roadway. It is not. So. A, it, it is not what What's, I would consider a reconstruction. What was the What was the What was the tag on that? What was the price tag on that? The overall project. I'm sorry. I, don't I know want to say 1.7 million, but I thought it was 2.1. Let me see. That's, That's, That's for asphalt. That's for all asphalt. Mm -hmm. Yep. It's also 50 foot wide, two miles wide. They just don't give anything away anymore. They don't. There, there is a lot of other asphalt projects going, <coughs> going. So excuse me, uh, going on in the community this year. So hopefully we get a bit, little bit better uh, bid price. Um, as I mentioned before, with the potential for tr temporary traffic lights at Division and West Burlington yeah. Avenue because of the, you know, the dedicated detour for West Burlington, the West Burlington West Avenue's roundabout. Division Street is the dedicated detour for that road. So <clears throat> you'll see that coming first, um, and then Agency Street should come online shortly after that. Along with that, West Burlington is also milling and overlaying from Agency Street from West Burlington all the way up to Gear. And then they are also doing Gear from um, Mount Pleasant Street to just uh, at the 34 overpass and they're also doing Broadway so the west part of town will be full of construction hopefully we can stagger this out far enough yeah. that they they don't all overlap um, all the asphalt projects are, are kind of a later August September type time frame but um, you know agency will be a mess this year and no doubt. and, and no along with the detour so division is we're gonna see a lot of traffic load on that so You'll probably see a proposal coming here shortly for the temporary traffic signal to go up at West Burlington and uh, Division. So, well, we believe in you, Nick. You're going to be able to figure all this out. So we appreciate you. Uh, appointments. Does anybody have any any problems with appointments? <clears throat> Are, were there? Do you know were there any others that applied for the Historic Preservation Commission? I don't have any idea if there were or not. Okay. I. I I don't have a usually, problem with the people that are that usually have applied. that they she would have okay. they they would show the others too. The others. Mm -hmm. There there's an extra T after KYS's name here in this list, so probably should fix that. Okay. Are we good then? We good? Yep. Okay. That's my stomach. Mr. Tesla, any closer remarks? No. Council Lady? No, thank you. Councilman? No. Mayor Pro Tem? No. Councilman? True. Um, uh, city Manager? Um, I'm out of town the next two days. Going to go with the chamber to uh, on their trip to Des Moines. Um, which means I'm not here to do the radio on Wednesday morning. I can do it next week if, if you're willing to switch around. Okay. Okay? Okay. All right. And that's really all I had. So. That's all you got. Okay. Again, thank you for uh, thank you for watching tonight. Come to beautiful downtown Burlington. Rob Sussman even got married here. Good night. <laughs> when they hear that, Rob.